Unemployed and Afraid acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on and of the land where you, the listener, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and extend our respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid, a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building your own business with the people doing it. I'm your host and fellow business builder, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into some good, honest small business chat. Hello there, business builder. As always, it's an honor to have your ears and for you to have chosen Unemployed and Afraid as your inspo, sidekick, connection point on all things small business building. And in this, our first ever mini series, which clearly I'm still very pumped about, where I'm bringing you a personal insight into the building of an online course. My online course, as maybe you've thought about doing one yourself, well, hopefully this will give you the inspo and the info you need to help you get there. So in the first episode of this mini series, I shared with you that I'm creating an online course that helps small businesses leverage their brand into their own successful podcast to create themselves a branded podcast concept that delivers results for them and for the listener. I'm putting together all my years of knowledge in radio, media, branded content, podcasting as a creator, and creating strategic branded podcasts into an online course. Scary reveal and honestly, an even scarier process. There's a lot to consider with creating this course and loads for me to learn on technically putting it together. So since then, I've found an incredible human to help me out and you. As if you've ever considered creating an online course, you probably have as many questions as I had before having this chat that you're about to hear. My guest is Tess Coniglio, a website designer, course creator, and Squarespace Circle member who has such an interesting perspective because she's been both an online course student and an online course builder for others. And in this episode, we really get into it. We chat about debunking some who can and should create an online course myths, exactly what makes a good online course. The different structure options and benefit of each, how to approach the development of your content, great ways to start small, overcoming the hurdles of tech fear and also self-editing in the cell, lots of price considerations and the steps to take before you go live. Aside from the online course advice that Tess shares, she also shares a little bit about her own small business journey, very unemployed and afraid style, and drops some invaluable perspective about building a business. And I know you're going to love that. We're all obsessed with that. Our small business folks tend to go it alone much of the time, but there is just so much goodness to be gained by asking for help. So I'm doing just that with Tess, who was thankfully ready to answer all of my burning questions about exactly how I get myself from where I am now into a confident space of content building for my online course. It is a ripping chat. Let's get into it. I'm here with Tess Coniglio, founder and designer at Digital Moves, a Squarespace web design company who are quote unquote the disco corner of the web creating badass websites. As a misfit of good design and code, Tess thrives in the company of enthusiastic solopreneurs, small business legends, and creative individuals in the service-based industry. Well, pretty safe to say you're amongst friends here. And just a quick visit to her own Digital Moves website will show you why she's such an in-demand web designer. She's created sites for Romina Favero PR, Good Times Pilates, the Pilates Instructor Hub, and Alexis Fernandez, creating the site for Alexis's popular podcast, Do You Fucking Mind? Anytime I can get a swear in this early is like, yay, for me. And the DYFM Plus online course. She's a Squarespace Circle member and expert with a goal to support service-based businesses to become bigger and braver through desirable design, 
strategic vision, and expert execution of websites and digital products that businesses can manage themselves. As a fellow small business human who supports other small businesses to flourish and disrupt on the World Wide Web, I couldn't think of anyone better to pick the brain of about what it takes to build a great online course. Tess, welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Hi, Kim. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. We eventually got around to hitting record because I had so many millions of questions to ask you <laughs> that I had to make sure we caught all of them because, yes, the world of building an online course for the first time has many a layer. So I'm very happy to have you here to Benjuria. Before we get into too much of the specifics, though, a little we get to know you. How do you think your best friend would describe you? Good question. <laughs> and I had to ask. <laughs> Brave would be a, a big one. I, I think I've bounced around a lot, career, life and all the things. She would describe me also as compassionate and very relatable. I think a lot of jobs I've had in the past, I need to relate to people and be compassionate and yeah, so those three things, definitely. Yeah, there's a real certain bravery that comes with switching careers, starting your own thing, doing it again, building something, putting it out there. I mean, I say it probably far too often to the listener, just how bloody brave we are doing this small business gig. So, you know, you are absolutely amongst people who feel passionate about that certain quality. And, you know, if like cool design is anything to go by, there's some real bravery in what you put out there as well. It's some pretty cool stuff. Oh, I have to not think about that someone might not be into what I'm putting out there. And I think in, in the fields I've been with, there'll always be someone who doesn't resonate with you. It's like, I can't be friends with everyone, right? It goes with business. Yeah. You can't please everyone. So put out what you love, put out what you love creating and, you know, those who like it will follow. That's absolutely brilliant advice. And right, as you said, I was thinking, yeah, damn straight. There's definitely some people I wouldn't get along with and wouldn't be friends with, the present company excluded. Right. But yeah, it's a it's, it's very true point. We, we have to back ourselves and, and be open to criticism and not let it bother us uh, because, you know, who cares? I love yeah. that. Great advice to start off with. Tell me a little bit about why you decided to get into the business of making websites and online courses. Very simply put, I needed a website. <laughs> When we went into lockdown, which we don't talk about, but I needed to shift digitally and I thought, well, I have all this free time. Uh, let's see how I go building websites. So I actually built my own website and pro it took me a while, a, a, a while, I would say two to three months, but that's not really anything in the scope of how long I was in lockdown being in Melbourne. So I, yeah, I did it and created, I was a Pilates teacher at the time, I still am. And I loved the process so much that I decided to do a course on how to build websites on Squarespace and loved that as well. And then decided, you know what, let's see how I go. Just doing a little bit of a side hustle. I started building websites for friends. And then I thought, okay, let's get a little bit more legitimate. So created an ABN and all those things. And then here I am today, three years on, and it is now my full-time gig. And I, yeah, absolutely love it. Oh, I just really love to hear how those sorts of moments of need can result in something that can really fulfill a part of your life and you just never could have planned for it. I think so much of that happens in business. We just end up in these careers. We're just like, oh, wow, like here we are. I needed something, so I made it. And now we keep growing. If I reflect on the things I've done in my life, because I've, I've changed careers a lot and I'm only 31, I can definitely say that being, I used to build window displays for big Australian brands. I used to be a visual merchandiser in fashion. So I feel like all these things, I've always been in, in design and I've carried that through more digitally now. Yeah. So as shitty as lockdown was, I definitely have it to thank because I don't know if I would be in this position I am today. You never know, but it's definitely, it definitely gave me that kind of kick in the bum to, to be like, well, what am I doing now? So yeah. Very, very grateful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A lot of good came out of that space. So the journey of creating my own online course is what brought you and I here together today. I am on this journey and sharing it with the listener as I go through this. And as you and I joked off air, I am at the very early stages and have a lot of questions and a lot I'm, I'm worried about and a lot I'm nervous about and, you know, I'm facing at the moment. But 
trying to give some perspective on that by talking to someone like yourself, because I know that there is so much value in sharing knowledge that you develop over the years with others. So before I get into those real specific questions to pick your brain on, I'd love your opinion and your thoughts on generally online course vibes. Like why would I or any other business owner create an online course in your opinion? Good question. I think someone should do it. I, well, bef- I'm going to backtrack. I think before we probably consider online courses as something a teacher would do, if you're a teacher, you, you would have some sort of higher education because you're teaching people how to do something. Whereas with online courses, I think that world has shifted. You know, you can learn from people who aren't necessarily teachers or educators because they're knowledgeable in something that you're interested in, right? So I think that mind frame has shifted and I think it's a really great opportunity to start creating these online courses if you're doing something or you have a service that you can offer for people to do it themselves. I think particularly even though we're talking about it again but with lockdown a lot of people had to do things themselves right because we couldn't go out and get it done for us. So I think that empowerment has really come out of that time that we all had in being like well I was able to build myself a website or I was able to go out and make myself bread instead of, you know, going and buying it. So I think there's that level that we're all um, doing things our, ourselves, which I think is really cool. But to answer your question, why? I think it's a really great opportunity for businesses to be able to offer a service that's not kind of their predominant, I guess, package or, for example, for me is building websites, right? But I could also teach someone how to build a website and that's not diminishing the value of what I do, but it's empowering them or giving them an opportunity that is potentially less, you know, financially for them to incur. Is that a sentence? (laughs) It's going to cost them less money, you know, if they were to learn it and do it themselves than if I were to do the whole thing. So I think having some variety in terms of what you can offer to people is a really great opportunity for businesses. It's also a really good way to build a bit of an online, I guess, community with people. Online courses I've done in the past, I'm definitely a part of a community there where, you know, we share ideas, we connect, we're all part of this thing that brought us together, which I think is really lovely. That's a really great point. And I hadn't thought about it from the perspective of education generally having shifted, you know, for someone whose passion lies in cultural insights, you know, the bigger movements that are happening around us as a society and as a culture, that behaviors that we do on the day-to-day ladder up to. That's something I hadn't considered that fundamentally education has shifted in that it's available to us by so many other people and so many other ways than it ever has been before and still doesn't diminish those who have absolutely gone and gotten you know, their masters and done their education uh, to be able to teach people in a school format. That's a um, really interesting way to look at it. And I, and I love that you bring up that knowledge that we fight so hard for over the years that we teach ourselves, that we go through all sorts of jobs and things, you know, your website design being a perfect example of that. It's not just that you went and did a course to learn how to be a website designer and then designed website. You also are bringing your unique perspective of merchandising and fashion and and that into design as well. This is hard fought knowledge that we've developed over the years as people in, in business and people in careers that can be given to somebody else now that can also be a benefit to them and a benefit for you because it's, you know, it's like you say, income and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. On the other side, what do you think holds business owners back from doing this? And now this is a loaded question because even though I am on this journey now, I've committed to this, I'm I'm doing this and I know I have a lot of really great and valuable information to share. I'm still incredibly nervous and there's a lot that's holding me back. Number one is the amount of post-it notes I have currently around my office of things I need to do. And all the things I don't know that I need to do yet, which is why I have your good self here to help me. But, you know, there's there's a lot that can hold us back. But what do you think holds business owners back from doing this? The biggest one that comes to mind for me is probably more the accessibility of having something that you can actually put an online course on. I think before we see Squarespace launching this really great digital product is businesses would be hosting different parts of their businesses on different softwares. So that's a lot of time, which as a business owner, we don't have a lot of, but learning multiple hosting platforms and systems and learning and integrating all those things, I think that could be something that would hold a business back from creating something like this. Production, I think for me is another one. It's quite a huge factor now, especially with so many things digital 
there's definitely a high level of production quality needed for online content. I mean, you look at gorgeous reels that people make and like for me, it takes hours to create mm-hmm. a reel. So I'm sure we can all relate to that. But yeah, I think knowing what you need uh, and of course, this is very dependent on the course that you want to build, what content you need. So, you know, what camera you might need, what microphone you might need, those sort of things I could see would be holding people back to create an online course. Such good points. I talk about this quite a lot on this pod generally, but just the sheer hell that is learning any kind of a new system. So, you know, when I I had to go and learn accounting software, which by the way, I still haven't done, I still don't actually know how to reconcile things properly, but you know, just having to go on and learn an accounting software and then having to go on and learn a new way of editing this podcast uh, through a new program, even this system that we're recording on right now, I'm using Squadcast and I had to learn this as a different way of recording. I was using Zoom before and everything feels like such a mountain because it's like, okay, get the platform, watch some resources, download, read things. You you feel like you have to put three or four days of your life away just to get ready to do the thing. So, uh, you know, I think that's something that we business owners can all just give a big virtual hug to each other for about how much that's underestimated. Like at the end of the day, you go have dinner with a girlfriend and they're like, how was your day? Like, how's everything going this week? And you're like, how do I even describe to you that I've had a hell of a day because I'm just trying to figure out how to use this new like editing software because it sounds so small, but it's such a big thing for us. So yeah, very, very valid point. And yes, very valid that it can be really frustrating when you've got too many different platforms. I mean, obviously that's why I'm here. That's why I was really excited. So I've been with Squarespace for ages. Both my sites have been with Squarespace for ages. And I feel comfortable within the template. And so seeing this drop in was like, yay, happy days. Doesn't take away from my learning fear. It is still something new to learn and something different. So yeah, but I can see how that would, would hold back. But Moreover, you brought up a point there on tech confidence. That's something I had taken for granted myself is that I have skills in knowing how to use a microphone. I have a good one, of course, thankfully. The listener's like, yay. But, you know, I have a good webcam. I, I have a little bit of editing skill in that. So I do have the ability that I've learned by being frustrated at systems for many years uh, to be able to do. It may not be perfect, but I know the basics. So I guess, you know, for the listener listening to this and thinking, oh God, that, you know, the tech confidence side of things, what would you say to, to those guys in terms of getting started and giving them some confidence as well to get started in like, it's okay to not have tech confidence? Absolutely. We're, we all start somewhere, right? And I think as small businesses, we definitely have an opportunity to not feel like everything we do needs to be 100% perfect from the get-go, right? I think if you can evolve your business based on, you know, the things that you can add or incorporate, whether that be a better camera or a better microphone, or I I feel this really applies to a lot of aspects of someone's business is you can make things better once you have the ability to make it better, right? It can't happen straight away at times. So I think my advice here would be, I guess, simply put, understand, I guess, the level of knowledge that you do have and how that can work for you in building the course. It's all well and good when you have ideas and you want to kind of add things into videos, but you don't know how to edit a video. It's Then I think that can be something that hinders you from building the course because you don't have that knowledge. If you want to learn then there's you know that can't stop you to learn the thing so that way you can deliver what you envision to have but don't feel like you need to learn how to use you know adobe systems or imovie because you want a video in your online course simply point and shoot record it And if you can potentially, you know, crop the start and the end, then you've got yourself a video. Yes, done is better than perfect. And yeah, if you go back and listen to my first podcast episodes, awful, awful quality. So (laughs) sorry about that. But yeah, I think it's excellent advice. When it comes to a great online course, so, you know, there's there's something, it's now existing, you know, we've got it out there and and I'm not like just skirting to the end goal. So by the way, because we've many a thing to discuss in between there, but in your opinion, what makes a great online course? I can be so subjective because everyone learns differently, right? And this is a learning space. But from, you know, in my opinion, I think variety is really important. And again, it's dependent on the product that you're you're offering, but video, audio, downloadable options, and all of these things that you can embed in a Squarespace online course. I would consider the process in terms of maybe a base. So, you know, is your, we're going to call you students now, is your student working through a doc 
that they have downloaded and they're filling out by hand? Or is it something that you've created on Google Docs? So that way they can type it out. Even though I create websites and do lots of code, I love a good old fashioned pen to paper. So have you got those two options for your student? Or again, depending on what the product is, is a Google Doc better for them to kind of work through throughout their modules? Another a great course that I did, which resonated, is how fun and interactive it was when I was learning code, which seems kind of like they don't really belong next to each other. But I was learning how to inject code and work with kind of the back end things of Squarespace. And the the teacher, our instructor, she splashed out a grab a drink of water. And it was a one minute of her having a little boogie drinking water. So I grabbed my water and I was drinking and I was like, this is great. And it's just so simple, but you know, it'd been an hour and a half and I hadn't had any water. So I loved that. <laughs> yeah. Another, another thing that would make an online course great, I guess for me is celebrating wins through a process, right? I've, I've done a lot of educations in different areas. So I can appreciate when you're going through something and, you know, there can, there can be times where a course can be a little bit tedious or you've got to get through that grunt. How can you establish, you know, success for that student, whether it's breaking them up in smaller pieces. So that way, rather than just doing this massive kind of dreaded part of the course that, you know, is the nitty gritty, how can you break that up? So it feels more achievable where your student can kind of celebrate their success or their win with each little bit. Yeah. Cause it's online. It's a lot harder to relate to people when it's not a face to face. So you've got to give them those parts of reassurance and success and wins throughout the course to make them continue the course because essentially they're motivating themselves. You're not there to do that. Yeah. That's wonderful advice. I have even seen that my partner very recently has just completed his honours year of psychology as a mature age student and every time he submits something, it's such a small thing, but every time he submits something to his university, like little confettis will come down on the screen and it's such a small thing, but it's like, it just triggers some sort of dopamine in your mind. It's like, I've just accomplished something. So yeah. I think that's a, a really great point in terms of as a student is finishing, and I love that we're using the term student now. It's the first time I've done it in this whole process. But as you know, my student is finishing a module that I've created, you know, how do I end that? Do I end that with a congratulations, with a, you know, a fun dance, with a, a little yay, you know, just to to give that feeling of accomplishment. Um, yeah. That's something that shouldn't be forgotten in the pressure of getting the actual content out and delivered to the other person. Just, yeah, don't forget the fun. That's really great advice. And considering it's a, you know, it is quite a personal, I guess, process because, for you to be the person that is teaching someone something. It's a really nice way for them to get to know a little bit about you or be a little bit silly in between the things that they're learning. Love it. Uh, so what is the first thing? So the first thing you go, oh, I'm going to do an online course. We've, we've got that. So I did that. First thing I did was who can help me? Let me ask some questions and let me tell all of my listeners right now what I'm doing so I can help them do it too. <laughs> Don't suggest that. That's a great idea for anyone to document the process while also doing the process. So for the person who doesn't like to overcommit themselves too much, what's the first thing we should do when building an online course? I think before you even get into the idea of building it, it's having that structure based on the course. So your content, I would decide on the outcome of the course and the takeaways that students are going to get from it. This is going to help you decide whether it's kind of broken up into weeks or modules or you know, bite-sized pieces for not only your students to understand, but for you to figure out how to deliver. Production costs would be something that you should consider even just before building it. So I guess just getting an idea of the things that you're going to need plus the content that you need before actually heading in to build. And then once you're in, it's for me, even with building websites, I feel like I have an idea of what I want to do, you know, in an old school format like pen or paper or outside of Squarespace before I actually head in to build. It's like when you're writing a caption on an Instagram reel, I write it in notes before I actually put it on Instagram. And that's just a process that works better for me. So if you're building it on Squarespace and you're finding that when you're writing your content or things aren't flowing naturally, then it might just be the space that you're doing it on. So potentially backtracking, writing it in Google Docs or Notion or whatever you use, yeah, it might be really helpful to actually start the building process. 
agree. I went old school with um, post-it notes, so different coloured post-it notes uh, for some reason. It's just it's something I did all throughout my media career as well. I would group in, okay, so all the green post-it notes are approvals that I need to seek for this idea that's just been created. Yep. Okay, cool. We've got bang, 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 bang. And then go into the purple post-it notes. Okay. These are all of the uh, queries that I need to respond to. These are the things I need to build. So yeah, that's, um, I'm a bit old school with the, the post-it and, you know, I think the benefit of being able to like map things out and kind of almost see it like, okay, this goes here, this goes there and be able to move it around. I'm a, I'm a yeah. big fan of that process. So yeah, yeah. we all find our, our funny little thing. Absolutely. So it's a bit of a me specific question here, but it'll probably help the listener too if you're in the same position as I am, which is I have a Squarespace website. So I have goodsideofthebed.com.au, which is where my online course is going to be a part of. And it's a website with pre-existing content. We won't get into the specifics of that because I have a whole bunch of hidden pages that I need to redo and then a whole bunch of new pages that I need to do as well. But for uh, you know me and for a listener who might have the same situation, we've got that website that I want to add the course to, what should I do next? So once you've got all your content and you're pretty much ready to go, I would definitely take some time in understanding the digital product, essentially. So the online course product, what the capabilities are within the software to plan it out, because you might be surprised you had envisioned it would look a certain way, but once you got in there, it might be slightly different. So you don't need to start paying for it in order to see it, which is amazing. You can pretty much set it up in your dashboard and then from there actually have a look at how it could lay out, what the structure would look like in terms of modules, where the videos could go, what can you add, what maybe can't you add. So things like that will give you a really good idea of if you didn't make any tweaks to your course. Yeah, so that would be a big thing is to actually go in and have a look at it because sometimes you imagine, oh, it's just going to be this really free style blank space that I can move things around, but it, not quite. <laughs> That's really comforting actually because I think for anybody in a creative industry with a creative mind starts to think about how it might look first. I'm into the names of things and the colours and, and that sort of vibe first up and yeah if we get in and we have that fixed vision in our mind and we created a whole bunch of stuff and then we go and say actually it needs to be this way that can derail us I guess a little bit of getting it going so yeah okay that's that's good advice familiarizing with the actual structure of it before getting too excited as I mentioned before I've kind of got a little bit of my content mapped out onto magical post-it notes around the place and now I'm hearing okay before I even get into putting it on the site it's about creating the content so like getting it site ready is there anything I should know the listener should know about getting it site ready like is there formats I'm thinking video does it have to be a certain type of file type or file size or uh, pds like google docs like is there anything I need to know in terms of making sure it's going to be able to sit on that platform before I get too far down the line not necessarily I mean always consider that when a file size is bigger it may take longer to load so little things like that Mm. but In my experience of building online courses, I haven't seen any videos fail because they've got, they've put those abilities in there because there's more content, there's more things happening on those certain pages. So no, in terms of video, it's generally like an iMovie or an MP4, that sort of thing. PDFs are great because people can download them and print them. However, with a PDF, it becomes a little bit more challenging to edit if if you've got a student that would prefer to do it on the computer. So a Google Doc is a really great way for people to edit things that you've created, whether that might be a worksheet that they run through in a module. And again, it's very subjective on how people like to learn. So for me, I really enjoy writing on paper, but if I am doing an online course, I would prefer it to be on my computer. And then that's only one thing that I need to take with me if I wanted to open it up and go through another module. So you could have the options. You could do, you know, download PDF to print out and work through, or here's the Google Doc link that you can work through digitally. Awesome. And with Google Docs, you don't actually edit in that Google Doc specifically. You're like, do the old file, save as, put into your (laughs) own drive and then edit. Yeah. Is that like a really simple way to do that? Like, is that an obvious (laughs) way to do that? I mean, an even more simpler way is if you were to, have a link to the Google Doc, you would open it up and you would just instruct the student to say file, make a copy, and it makes them a copy for them to edit through. Yeah. 
So there's a bunch of different ways you could do it. But yeah, as long as it's simple for them to realize that they can grab the link, either copy it or save as, yeah. Yeah, great. I can imagine it wouldn't be anybody's ideal to like go into a Google Doc and then they've got, oh, here's some other random students' ideas. Like, so I guess we need to lock it and make sure that can't happen. I've seen it before, but it, it's kind of funny. <laughs> it's like, who's this person? <laughs> oh, look, we've all got to start somewhere. And Lord knows that I am, I'm nervous about the mistakes I'm going to make, but we're going to make them and it's, it's fine. <laughs> what uh, other things should I be creating for the course? So I mean, I'm assuming FAQs is one that I'm going to have in mind. And, and of course, it's going to be a bit of a challenge because it's hard to think about what frequently asked questions I might have for something nobody's ever asked a question about. Right. So, but what else should I be creating? What sort of things are required for a course? Well, I guess treat the course essentially like a product that someone is buying because it is it's just a digital product. So you want to create a course overview page that will talk about the course because that is the page that people will get to before they even decide they want to buy it and then go in. So an overview page with information about the course, keep it really clear on what the objective is and what the outcome is, I think is really important. There's nothing worse than you want to learn something and then you're reading through and it's not quite clear if you're going to learn that thing. So be direct about what the outcome is of the course. And FAQs are amazing. And the great thing about you building the online course on Squarespace, if you're already managing a Squarespace website like you, Kim, is you can just add FAQs that come along the way. So it's great. And it's something why I love about Squarespace is these businesses can just adapt based on, you know, how they evolve or how the course is going or what are questions people seem to be emailing that you didn't put in the FAQs. Can I just ask an extra question on that? So would you suggest that that course overview page actually gets created after the course content? So you've kind of got everything done and then you go create the course overview or would you do it the other way? Like do the overview first and then do your content? I would do the overview after because you may have done an overview and then you've built a course and the overview doesn't reflect the course anymore. So rather than doing it twice, do it at the end. I feel that. Yeah. It's like anything, right? Yeah. We start with any kind of creation and we're like, it's going to be this. And then you go on the journey and it decides to be something else because just by the sheer act of, you know, action creating information, you, you mm. learn a lot more. So, okay, good. That's that's good to know. Are uh, there anything else? So I'm thinking about privacy policies. This is something I worried about before when I was in e-com on, on my side and just tried to kind of piece together. But now I'm thinking about IP and the concern about like digital products and who can access them and what they do with them if they recreate them. Do you, and I totally appreciate you're not a lawyer here. <laughs> so, you know, this is just, have you come across this for anyone you've worked with before? And yeah, IP, what do we do about it? I mean, I've come across my public liability waivers being in the fitness industry. So those sort of things, I'm very wary about privacy policies with websites. When it comes to content or online courses and protecting your IP, you have the ability to create what's called a click wrap agreement when someone goes to purchase the course. And again, you can do this through Squarespace by adding it's essentially additional info to like your cart or your checkout part of the website. And you would want to put an agreement there. So when they click that box and hit purchase, they're agreeing to your terms and conditions that you've laid out. And yes, I'm not a lawyer, but you've got that ticked saying that they agreed to your terms and conditions and look out, buddy. <laughs> I love that. I might actually put that on my actual checkbox on there. If I can free write it, I might actually put look out, buddy. <laughs> I've seen in the past loads of online courses or promotion of online courses. You know, if I'm, I've said this before, I think to a couple of people, but my toxic trait is that, that I'd love to sign up for online courses <laughs> and I sign up for webinars and I have a million of them and I have a million things that I get to watch. I just, I do really enjoy learning and I noticed a bit of a trend in recent times of online courses that have one web page and it's kind of, you know, the course overview page and it's an endless scroll that seems to very gradually convince me why I should buy it before I even see the price of the thing. Can you talk me through a little bit of this approach, maybe, you know, how to do it if it's good or why not to do it if you don't think it's a great idea? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, it sounds like a really clever overview page and I think if you can get all the answers to the questions that your potential student is asking, then you've done a really great job at an overview page. And I think that is just a really clever collection of 
information about the course, what to expect, the duration, the outcomes, who's running the course, really important. They want to get to know who's doing, you know, who's the teacher, questions that they might have, payment options, which may end up quite far down or kind of split throughout really um, sneakily on signing up. What they need for the course is a big one. Sometimes you're you figuring out if it's right for you, but then you don't realize you need, you know, a 75 inch TV to make it happen. That was an exaggeration, but <laughs> <laughs> thank God. Yeah. But basically anything they need for the course, you know, so they can successfully do the course, which makes up a really good overview page. I think there's a lot of SEO and things like that in the back end. If you've Googled how to build a website, they've, they've put those words in place on their course for that for them to, to come up in your Google and things like that. But I think for a successful overview page or if it's a successful way to get people to buy your online course is answer the, any question that they may have, be clear, be really direct about what the outcomes of the course are going to be. And that way, not only we have people signing up, but you'll have people completing the course and talking about the course. And we all know word of mouth is a, a really great marketing tool. It's definitely how I've gotten to where I am because I'm just not I'm not great on social media. I just, but word of mouth seems to be doing really well. So yeah, that would be my my spiel on a class of no hope view page. That's brilliant. And yes, social media marketing, we actually talked about this a little bit before we hit record, just like the reminder constantly, like, oh, I'm doing something, I should put it on socials and let me promote myself on socials is, yeah, it's a challenging one. And, you know, if you do focus on doing great work, the, the work does still does still come if that's something that holds you back. One point you raised there that I found really interesting that I thought worth stopping down on is promoting who you are or in my instance, promoting who I am. Uh, as an expert in this space and making that really clear, I think this can be an area where a lot of us get a bit uncomfortable about, you know, that asshole imposter syndrome mm. sneaks in and is like, I need to have, you know, many, many accolades or followers or press features to be able to show why I am the right person to be teaching this. I think that's something that all of us feel, you know, we want to show proof before we back ourselves. But I guess I wanted to stop down on that because, you know, it's a message to myself but it's also a message to anyone else who's thinking about creating an online course for their business is if you've done a thing, if you've created a thing, you've got a lot of knowledge and a lot of knowledge worth sharing and to just back ourselves in that expressing who we are. You know, there's so much more that goes into developing the skills that we have than we realize that doesn't necessarily come out in certain massive milestones. You've just got so much value to express and that now is not the time when you're introducing yourself to a potential student to let that imposter syndrome sneak in and downplay all the effort and all the work that's gone into creating the knowledge that's now creating this online course. So yeah, that's, I guess, my little pep talk to myself and to anybody else, which is like, go hard at why you're great because you're great and you know a lot of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think if you can find a way to show the enjoyment that you had creating the course, I think speaks a lot. With courses I've done online, particularly in web design and, and code, I've, I've actually been sold on the person that has created the course, not so much the content, because even though I was able to find that content everywhere and a lot of people were, were offering it, it was the person that was doing the course that sold me. I felt like I could relate to how they taught. I could relate to how the course was structured. So just because you have other people potentially in your field doing something similar, that might not mean it is the right way for everyone to learn how to do the thing. I think if you maybe learn differently or find ways that you can share your knowledge with people that is not similar to what other people are doing, you might be surprised at the people that come your way. Yeah. I mean, look, people buy people, don't they, at the end of the day? Like we are, we, we can't help ourselves. You might have the money in your back pocket to go buy a new car, but if that car salesman is a bit of a douchebag, we're not going to buy the car, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> One area that is playing on my mind a lot is twofold. And that is financially, you know, you can see how creating an online course can be a really wonderful way to get some passive income in and, you know, utilize all the skills that you have, give them to other people, help them grow, but also start to get some reward yourself, you know, for, for all of that. So my question here is financial and it's two part, which is 
okay, the cost of creating the course, what should I be thinking about in terms of what course package to do? So how, you know, paying monthly and, and things like that, like what should I keep in mind in your opinion about these Squarespace courses and what works for most people, but also when and how should I start to think about pricing the thing? So the cool thing with Squarespace, and we'll talk about kind of the options there with them, is you can upgrade at any time. So you can start at a kind of a lower tier, like a starter plan. And if you feel like you're developing more content or more digital courses, you can bump it up when you need to, which is great. Paying annually is always cheaper than paying monthly. So, you know, if I'm going to recommend pay annually because it'd be very unlikely for you to drop it in a year anyway. You know, you always got to give things time for them to get put out there for you to promote it, things like that. So commit to the year of having an online course. And the great thing with Squarespace is you can create multiple courses even on a starter plan. So that is a really cool way for you, Kim, and for others to consider if you're feeling like a course that you're creating is large in content and perhaps you want to split it into mini courses. There's no template where you need to do a six-week or eight-week course. Maybe you do mini courses based on um, the thing that you want to put out there and that might help you figure out, okay, well, I can do this. I can create this now. And then you're starting to already build a bit of a community of people that are interested in the things that you want to share. So then you start to build more courses that all tie in or relate to the same thing. So that's really cool. I love that about Squarespace. In terms of how you're going to price it, obviously I would consider the market and if there's other things within your service that offer something similar. It is really subjective. You know, people buy art that's worth lots and lots of money and then someone can say, well, that's freaking ugly. So <laughs> I like to go to extreme with my, um, <laughs> my metaphors. But it is very subjective. So I would consider the time that you've invested into it, your knowledge and, you know, how it's going to support you maybe in a passive way for your business. The way I like to think about if you're going to sell something that, you know, could be you know, a couple thousand dollars or however you want to, however you want to price it, can you offer something that it is at a lower rate or potentially free? Example, Kim, you've got a podcast, which, you know, you're offering this amazing knowledge to people. Then you have the ability to price point something at a premium level because you've got different services and, you know, price points within the business. So it's very subjective and it, it's hard to give you an, a definite answer to that because there's courses out there that range from zero to 10,000 and more dollars. So I would I'd consider the time, the knowledge you're putting into it, how the Squarespace system can work for you in terms of split payments and subscriptions and things like that. And I can talk a bit about that if you like, Kim. Yeah, I think let's get into a little bit of that because I think that's, you know, a big question that a lot of people have is, yeah, how do I take payments? How long term is this going to be? But also there's a great point that you raised there about expectation setting. And I don't know if you if you meant to, but giving it a year to to really like fine tune it, put it out there and not to allow it to just be a I'm going to create this course. I've got my hopes up that 50 people are going to buy this in the next month and then I'm going to be passively supported ongoing for the next rest of my life in this one thing that I create. And, you know, I think that expectation setting around that's really, really important and knowing that it's something that you've got to give time to just like anything with creating a podcast, it's exactly the same. Like a lot of people create a podcast and then think, great, it's going to be on the charts number one in this category within the first week. And I'm going to have so many followers on to it. So many, so many listeners are going to be in every press feature. I'm going to be picked up. And then really you release it and you get crickets and it's consistency and it's patience and it's tweaking and it's changing and it's adapting and it's getting better, putting it out there. So I really love that you brought up that point of expectation setting. And uh, wanted to pull that out to make a bit of a point of it, that building an online course is something that is, it's an investment. It's an investment in you, in your knowledge and how much you value yourself and the students will come and they will continue to come and you will continue to get better as an educator in that space as well. So I love that. But yes, talk to me a little bit about pricing in terms of, and I guess it's so variable about what sort of courses you create and if it's one that's designed to be done in order, out of order, drip fed, things like that. But yeah, a little bit about pricing in terms of payment models. So you've got three options within Squarespace. You can have a fixed payment, you can have a subscription base and you can have it, it can be free. So with a fixed payment, it's essentially paying upfront 
but that can also be split into two, three, all the way up to 12 payments. Now with new products that launch, there's always tweaks that need to happen. So if you do create an online course and created a split payment, so a split fixed payment, the student has the ability to cancel it. So I would consider what we talked about before is smaller chunks of a course. If you think that your course is going to be potentially on a larger scale and a higher fee, so potentially breaking it up. So that way they're still pretty much doing your online course, but you've split it up into little mini ones. And that way they're more manageable on a financial level and also from a content level. But otherwise, if you feel like $200 is really palatable, then a one payment is is a really great option for that. And it's super easy to connect through Stripe or whoever you use to take your payments. Subscription-based is kind of, you know, what subscription means is a fee, whether it's weekly or monthly, until the, the student cancels. So for me, I don't envision an online course at a subscription level because they might subscribe for a month and then get all this content. But however, drip fed content can work really well with that. So they would have to wait for that content to be released, which again is something that you can do through Squarespace, creating these modules and then perhaps not releasing them until a month in or two months in or things like that. That's a really good option if you are doing more of like an enrollment based online course. So you want everyone to start at the same time. Subscription and drip fed is a really great way to manage uh, an enrollment style. But if you're creating a course and you want it to be, you know, quite self-sustainable, I would opt for more of a fixed payment scheme. So that way it does its thing. People can sign up at any time. Um, Yeah. So there's a couple of ways to go about it, but consider what the overall fee would be for an online course that you're creating. If it's going to be on a larger scale and you would really like your potential students to have the option to split the payments so they're a bit more manageable, then would the idea of creating more module, mini modules essentially, because, you know, that would in a way create the whole course, but you have the ability to create small payments rather than one large one. That's very cool. I hadn't actually considered that. I was sort of thinking about this a while ago when I was first kicking around the idea of my own online course, you know, how much of it would be me talking about, you know, only two weeks to go, one week to go and kind of going down the path of creating that demand. And now that you've profiled it in my mind for me is that's an enrollment course and it's about, you know, you release it a couple of times a year and then then you roll it out, which is a great option. Or there's that other side, which is the on-demand course, which is just something that can, you can create once. You can have it there. You can iterate it and change and add to it and pull out smaller bits, but it's something that's constantly there. So that's just a really interesting point, I think, for both me and the listener to think about is, do you want it to be something that's time sensitive that you dedicate a bit of time to in your life and therefore all your marketing around it is, you know, it's opening in August or it's opening in January and two weeks to go, three weeks to go, or is it more that more passive on demands that, you know, someone can come in and do at any time that you might not get that sort of hype out of, but it might also be a little bit more passive in terms of your time because, you know, essentially we're talking about taking, I mean, Squarespace say it all the time. So it's like, it's actually their marketing has worked on me because it's the business inside your business. Yes. And, you know, that's what we're, we're looking at here is if you are a, a florist and you've created a beautiful store and you, you know, you're doing your daily blooms type thing where you've got, you know, small going out and subscriptions, you've got that beautiful floristry business. And then you're also creating an on-demand online course that teaches people how to make beautiful arrangements. Like that's when you would go for more of that maybe on-demand and it just kind of ticks over so you can focus on running your business. It's like best of both worlds. So yeah, it's just a, a good thing to think about, I guess, before you even get started going down course creation is, is there going to be a, a live element as part of this or is this going to be 100%? Well, nothing's 100% passive, but pretty passive. It's like figuring out how much, I guess, time you want to invest, you know, post it being out there into the world. And there are so many other ways that you could make it, I don't want to use the word interactive, but I guess more personal. If you feel like a course that's really passive means that you've stepped away from it for, for it to be sustainable to run itself, how can you, I guess, develop um, this, what we spoke about earlier is kind of having a space for your community to connect, whether that's on Facebook or whether that's on Slack or whatever you like to use for your students to talk about what they're doing and for you to actually 
connect with them on a level that is, you know, closed off and it's only specific to the people that have purchased that premium, um, you know, package with you. So I think there's ways that you can curate it to, for it to still feel like you're engaged with the community, but still it's, you know, almost, you know, 99.9% passive. And then there's that intake route that you, you just mentioned, Kim. Yeah, both wins. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So scoop me forward hours and hours to when I've created everything I've uploaded it and it's, it's out there. I'm ready to go. How do I go about testing everything before setting it live? Because, you know, big fear, you, you set it live and someone goes on and pays for it and then none of the videos load or something goes horribly wrong. That's definitely a fear I have. So what do you suggest about testing everything? Well, the cool thing with the digital product is it's very similar to like you were editing a page on a Squarespace website. You can still view it even if you haven't you know say enabled the page or you've made updates or things like that it's definitely important to run through what it would be like for a potential student to um, once they've gone through your overview page to selecting the pricing option to purchasing it what are the prompts and you know they're the things that I had to go through physically when I first started building online courses is like okay well what can I customize what can't I customize because there's levels of security to protect people's information, credit card details, those sort of things. You know, I was like, I want that in my client's branded colors, but I couldn't, <laughs> which I totally get. So what I would do is once you're ready to go, and again, people can't access your online course unless you have the link to pay for it, right? It's behind a paywall. It's not access accessible to the general public unless you have that option to say sign up. So what I've done is I've disabled the um, overview course or I've put it behind a password that only I can access. And I logged in on another browser because I, I use multiple browsers because I like to see how things work on Safari, Chrome and Brave. And if you still use Safari, stop using Safari. <laughs> <laughs> There's better ones out there. So I would go on another browser and essentially go on my client's website like I'm about to purchase the course. So, and to see what the experience is, basically it would be signing up, putting in my details, getting a verification code from Squarespace to say like I'm a real human and then putting in the payment details and then seeing what goes on from there. Because when I first started, I was like, so what happens when they've bought it? Like, how do they get there again? And that's something I was like, hang on, I need like a login page, like a login button. And it's really easy to find once you've done all that, it's in your nav. And I won't go into detail with the square say spit, but Kim, we can chat about it more if you like. Making sure you've got that button there for people to easily log back in. That's something I missed with one of the first times I built that. So go through the process of what it looks like. And a great way to go through that entire process is actually putting in a 100% discount code, obviously that only you know. So that way when you're checking out, you don't have to pay for it, but it's the exact same process that someone who were to pay for it would experience. And then you can see how it runs and you can go through the modules and see, you know, the complete progress bar and those, you know, really nice little quirks that Squarespace has provided to make it feel like it's a course. It's not just a bunch of pages put together. So just remember that as long as your, you know, sign up button isn't available, people can't access it, even if it's there and it's built and it's ready to go. There's definitely things that you can put in place to make sure that you can test things. And look, even for me on a, on a level where I make this my job, there's always things that you miss. So my rule of thumb is whenever I launch something, I am glued to my computer for a good five hours after because that is when you start to pick up little things just that you might have missed or someone might might look different on for them. Um, so yeah, take time to go through the process. Look at all the settings that are under digital products. And even if you're not sure what it means, just click it. You might realize that you didn't put your business information in or you might have realized that you needed to connect something else. So there's always something to look at. Just take your time because that really is those little finale details that you want to make sure everything runs smoothly. Such great advice. And I wish I had had that advice many moons ago when I first dropped my ceramics for sale direct to consumer on my website that I could have actually just put in a 100% discount code to be able to do a transaction. Because I was like, when I went live, I thought about doing a test transaction, but I thought, yeah, but I'm going to 
gonna get I'm gonna be paying myself transaction fees. I gotta, <laughs> I'm gonna actually this is I do this. And then yeah, if I had just put in a hundred percent discount code, problem would have been solved. But yeah. yes, I, I agree with that. And I have a very, very distinct memory of my first sale coming through for ceramics, which happened to be a very large order for a very prominent Airbnb. And luckily the person was connected with me on Instagram because they said, I'm really trying to grab these pieces, but I can't seem to get the payment through on your website. And it was something I hadn't done with PayPal. And yeah, I was actually doing it on the side of the road (laughs) because I was driving at the time with my laptop. So yeah, sitting glued to your computer is an excellent piece of advice. So thank you for dropping that one. And if you've got people that can look at it as well for you, like friends and family, do the same thing, give them a code and that way they can, they go through it or someone that you work with. It's always good to have another set of eyes checking that everything runs. The good thing with the online course, Kim, is if you hadn't connected Stripe or PayPal, you would not be able to go through the process of paying. So yeah, you would have been like, hang on, why does this say my co- this course is unavailable? And it's because you hadn't set up your payments. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. A few measures built in. That's yeah. very handy. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to leave me and the listener with about the creation of an online course or anything you wish more people knew? I would say be open to feedback on how the course resonates with with your with your customers or, or your students again as small businesses you know we don't always get everything right the first time so if you have an open line of communication whether that's a mailing list um where people once they've enrolled they're part of like that mailing list you can reach out to them or having some sort of like slack channel or facebook group that's closed off so students can share experiences I think is a really great way to make a course better, improve on it. You know, what things are you doing really well? What things could you do better? Those sort of things. I guess don't assume that there's only one way to do it because we're all completely different human beings and learn differently and have different experiences. So um, just because you're doing it one way and someone's doing it another way, it doesn't mean you're not doing it correctly. Yeah, I think be open to the the idea that it could evolve in different ways as well. I just wrote myself a note down that says, find a way to have a give it to me feedback, open line of communication in a way that encourages people to be generous with their feedback as well. I think, you know, we're, I'm definitely fearful of negative feedback on anything. Like, goodness, the day that I get a terrible review on this pod, like heartbroken, mm. <laughs> we're devastated, but we learn from feedback and If we can encourage it to come through, perhaps it will be delivered more generously, even if it is on the side of negative. Um, So yeah, I think that's, I think that's excellent advice to end on. And and you have been very generous with your advice today, Tess. It's such a gift to have you here, to be able to pick your brain, to be able to have this support and this advice for myself, to be able to share it with the listener, to get us all closer to absolutely smashing it in business goals, which is what we're hundred percent here for on this pod. So In return, how can the listener and I support you to grow your business? So you can follow me on social media where I regularly post, not really, but (laughs) (laughs) so I'm digital moves with two underscores in between digital and moves. Business website, digitalmoves.com.au. You can check me out. And if my website is down, then I'm probably working on it because I'm constantly working on it. (laughs) Oh, brilliant. I'm going to make sure to have the links to everything there in the show notes. I know as of currently, when I go onto your website, there's a very fun disco ball that gets used as the cursor, which is so enjoyable. So listen, I just encourage you to go on and have a little play with that because it really is a fun corner of the internet. So I will make sure to have the link to everything in the show notes so the listener can go and get around you. Once again, Tess, thank you so much for your generosity of time and knowledge today in helping me get a little closer to creating my online course and hopefully the listener getting a little bit closer to having the confidence to do the same so we can all start generating that well-deserved passive income. Thank you so much for being with me today. Pleasure, Kim. Thank you. I'm here for the passive. (laughs) Listener, if you want to create your own online course in your zone of genius, firstly, yes, and let's do it together as I share with you the journey of creating my online course on how to build a big branded podcast for your small business. And I really hope bringing you behind the scenes like this helps to show you how you can build your own online course too. 
make sure to join me in the next episode where I'll share with you exactly how I'm going, how I'm making it real, approaching the building of my content, how I'm working through what pricing structure I'm going to go with and loads more insider goss on the journey as I uncover it. I hope you wish me luck. I would love to know your thoughts on what we're creating here, my course, but also this mini series. So make sure to slide into my DMs on IG at Unemployed and Afraid and or leave the Potter review on Apple or Spotify, wherever you're listening. You know how much I love those. And if you are interested in learning how to create your small business, a big podcast, head to goodsideofthebed.com.au and drop me your email to be one of the very first people to access it. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the podcast for small business builders with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid wherever you're hanging out, and I'll see you there.